Now, you've heard of the hound of heaven. That's the spirit of God that tracks a man down and never gives up on him. The Holy Ghost got you, didn't he? I mean, he hunted you down until he found you. Now, let me talk to you about the hunter of hell. This is the devil himself who hunts down the most precious children of God to seek and destroy them. Now, you remember the story of Lucifer? He was a bright and morning star, according to Isaiah. He shone in God's firmament, and he was cast out of heaven because pride came into his heart. But when he was cast out, the Bible said he took one-third of all the angels with him. Now, don't think for a minute that he took the least among the angels. I believe that the devil, when he was cast out of heaven, went through the kingdom of God and seduced and deceived the most elect the most chosen bright stars in the kingdom. All these who fell with Satan were cast out of the kingdom of God, were just like himself, useful, chosen vessels, sons of God. Have you ever thought of this? What kind of uh, seduction did Satan use? How in the world could he deceive angels at the very throne room of God? How did he get to angels? What kind of temptation seduction to use on angels now you and I know that he's taken down more than a third of mankind you and I know what kind of seductions he uses on us but what kind of seduction did he use on angels a lot of people think that the devil's got a well-oiled kingdom a well-oiled machine that he's king of the pile and that everything he says they snap to attention Do you know why these angels were cast out of heaven with the devil not because they worshiped Lucifer no they were all just like him they were lifted up in pride. And I want to tell you something. The devil's kingdom is one of chaos. It's all the devil can do to stay on top of the pile. He's got insurrection after insurrection. He's got demon after demon after demon trying to take his throne. The kingdom of darkness is in total chaos. That's why I don't understand Christians who are scared of the devil and the kingdom of hell. Because that kingdom is shaking from one end to the other. It's in total chaos and total darkness. Lucifer, the scripture says, Isaiah, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Your glory is brought down to the grave. The glory, this angel and all of those morning stars is like him. Satan was cast out of heaven to the atmosphere, and he became known in the Old Testament as an adulteress. He has other names, Belial, Satan, but one of his terms, they're most descriptive in the Old Testament is adulterous, one who hunts down and seduces people. Now, God gave me a scripture that has really blessed me. In fact, it's helped change my theology. I spend my summers on the streets of our American cities, and it has really given me a new vision, a new love, and I want it to give you a vision and love. Proverbs 6.26, The adulteress will hunt for the precious life. The adulteress will hunt for the precious life. In other words, Satan goes after those who are the most beloved and valuable to the kingdom of Jesus. He hunts down the good ones, the innocent ones, the most important in the kingdom of God. Because the word precious actually means valuable, beloved, most highly esteemed, the very dearest, those most highly regarded for some spiritual or moral quality. You see, Satan, the Bible said, goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But who is it that he seeks to devour? He seeks to devour the most beloved, the most highly prized in the kingdom of God, the dearest, the most valuable, the most precious. Why do drug addicts and alcoholics who come into the church, and many of them not even converted yet, and they still have Satan working in their life, they go after the most innocent girls in our church. And why are often innocent girls attracted to the most ungodly boys? It's the spirit of the adulteress hunting down the precious life. Why is it that the confirmed homosexual who's given himself over to reprobate mind goes after innocent boys? Come on, you know that's true. Because the adulteress hunts down the precious life. In Upper Manhattan, around 115th Street, one of my workers had been ministering to a gang of deaf and dumb that were drug addicts, a gang of 15. The worker set up an appointment for me to go into a, one of their hideouts and minister to them. And she knew sign language. She gained friendship with them. And I walked into this dilapidated tenement house, and I saw five young teenage deaf 
dumb mutes. I was introduced, and then they told me to sit down. They wanted to get fixed first, and they had two bags of heroin. The girl was 15 years old. She had red hair, freckles, a very pretty little girl. And I looked at these five teenagers, the veins in the neck sticking out, and they forgot I was in the room. And I watched them stick those needles in the vein, especially that little 15-year-old red-headed girl. I couldn't get her out of my mind. All these years, I've never forgotten her. She was so tender and so sweet and so innocent looking. And to see her take that dirty needle after the blood was still in it from the veins of those other guys, and many of them had hepatitis and jaundice, and watch her make a turn, stick the needle in her vein, and then just lay back and let it come on. And I remember thinking, Lord, they don't have enough problems. They can't speak. They can't hear. They live in their own world of despair. And I thought, Lord, you love these kind who hurt like this. You really love them. And this is what the devil does. He goes after the precious ones. Those poor kids, absolutely bombed and stoned. I had to wait for about ten minutes till they came up. And then they were willing to listen. And I ministered to them. Thank God that worker of ours got through to about ten of them before it was all over. I was in a Brooklyn apartment one day to pick up a young man by the name of Jose. He'd been a drug addict for years. He was about 19, 20 years of age, starting when he was 14, 15. And I went to his apartment to get him. And he had a little bag and he threw some clothes in it. And I noticed in the living room two little children, about three and four years old, a boy and a girl, sitting there holding hands with big eyes, scared to death like two little bunny rabbits. And we were about to leave. Now, this boy's mother was a prostitute, and she was out walking the street. The boy's father was a drug pusher and was in prison. And this boy was coming with me. And we were about to head down the stairs, and I said, Jose, what about your little brother and sister? Nobody's here in the apartment. And he pointed to the table. There was a little package of Oreo cookies and a stale carton of milk. And he said, all they feed themselves, there's, there's food on the table. They stay two or three days by themselves. I couldn't bring myself to leave. And about five minutes later, the mother came in. She wouldn't dare. She, she would never give those kids to me to put into a foster home because she gets the welfare check for supporting them and she needs that money for drugs. And I looked at those two little children. I thought, for sure, those are the precious ones that Satan is going to go after. Those are the precious lives. Like the little five-year-old girl I saw in Midtown, on 8th Street, we're going up to a flat rooftop to talk to some drug addicts and a little four-year-old girl sitting there on the door stoop trying to stick a toothpick in her vein, pretending it's a needle, acting like a drug addict, like her brother up on the roof. And you see these kids, and you know those are the innocent ones that Daltris is going to go after. I had a minister bring his two sons, two drug-addicted sons, teenagers, 15, 16 years of age. He had just been told a few hours before that his boys were drug addicts. The sergeant at the precinct had called him. When the pastor went into the precinct, the police officer rolled up the sleeves of both boys and said, Preacher, don't you know your boys are mainliners? They sat on two chairs opposite my desk. The pastor took his hat off, put it on my desk. He said, Mr. Wilkes, and I read your book, The Cross and Switchblade. Never in all my life would I believe I'd be here like this now. He said, I've gone to prison to stand for the parents and children of those in my church, never knowing that my two boys were going to end up like this. He said, these were innocent kids. They were both called to preach. They sang the songs. They went to youth camp. They had a touch of God. My wife found funny smelling cigarette. Think about it. She found some blood on the bed sheets. I know now that they were shooting in the room and when their veins were bleeding, it was on the sheet and we didn't know it. We, their grades were failing. But you don't think of those things. I never thought my kids could be drug addicts. He was heartbroken. As soon as he got out of the precinct, he brought them right to the center. And he turned and he knelt between his two boys and looked them in the eye and he said, Now look, you're killing your mother. And his wife had to go to bed. He would called her and she was absolutely stricken. You're killing her. And then he said, if you've got any love left for me at all, if, I don't know where I went wrong, but if you have any love for me or your mother left, please let Brother Dave give you a bed. Get into the center here and let Jesus clean you up. And all the hardness of those boys, they just sat there 
gazing at him with stony eyes. And it so overwhelmed the pastor, the hardness of those two kids. He just fell prostrate right in front of them, pounding his fist on the floor and saying, My God, where did I fail? And I was crying. I was deeply moved. And I, I thought to myself, surely that will move those kids. I saw those two preacher sons get up and walk right over their father and go to the door and look back and laugh at him. That poor man got up, shook the dust, got his hat, and just walked out the door shaking his head. I never got to say anything. I've never forgotten them. I don't know what's happened to them. But you see, this is what I'm talking to you about. The adulteress came after two precious preacher sons who had a call of God, who were just like many of Satan, went after them, seduced them. I've had reporters ask me, Sir, what's the most horrible thing that's happened to you in all your years with troubled kids? And I never hesitate. I remember it well. In fact, it was an auditorium, a high platform and steps on the side, both sides. And I just finished, was about to leave, curtains behind me. And a 15, 16-year-old girl was leading a blind boy, big, tall, 6'2", just skin and bones. His eyes were black and blue and sunken in his head. His teeth had rotted. He was almost bald. And my first impression was that the girl was bringing her drug-addicted brother who had cancer. I said, I thought, he's been through chemotherapy. He's lost his hair. He has terminal cancer, and she wants me to pray. So I waited. And I watched him come. He had a silly grin frozen on his face. His muscles had... Cheeks had frozen. I don't know what it is, but the grin was frozen on his face. He couldn't move. And she told me a sad story. She said, Mr. Wilkerson, this is my boyfriend, Jimmy. She told me how he'd been such a fine church-going kid, played on the football team, weighed over 200 pounds, husky, healthy, a good boy. Never used drugs, never ran with a crowd. She said, he had read your book about six months ago. Across the street, it was required reading in English class, and he did a report on it. She said, Mr. Wilkson, he went to a high school party. The football team had a party and some other high school kids. And those are the days that speed and acid just sweeping all through the country. And some kids had brought acid and speed, and they were dropping and crank. And on a dare, they kept daring him and on a dare and through peer pressure and she said probably out of some curiosity Mr. Wilkson he dropped a tab of acid someone had either on purpose or accidentally mixed strychnine with it and a lot of strychnine had been mixed in a lot of the LSD in those days in fact in some of our crusade we had to have ambulances waiting outside we'd have three or four kids crashing doing the preaching I'd have 50 drug crazed kids at the altar at a time and many of them coming down had to be taken by ambulance to the hospital. And someone had mixed strychnine, and he had a bad trip, and the, the effect on his body was devastating. And he was paranoid. She said, he won't hurt you. You have to feed him. She said, I loved him then, Mr. Wilkes, and I love him now. And I want you to pray for him. And I looked at that burned out, bombed out kid, and I got mad. I'd seen so much of it. Get mad at the devil. And I said, honey, wait here just a minute. And I went right behind the curtain. And I had a good cry. And I got it out of my system. And I came back with a holy anger in me. And I took that boy by the hand. And I said, oh, God, heal him. Open his eyes and his heart. And, oh, did I pray. And then I opened my eyes a minute. And my heart sank because I realized he wasn't hearing a word I said. Took them down the side. There were a group of young people from one of the churches I knew. And a young pastor I knew. I introduced them. I told them the story. I said, here, will you please adopt this boy and his girl? I know that. That boy got prayer and attention, and in my heart, I believe I'm going to meet him someday, and he's going to be in his right mind. I really believe that. God gave me hope on that. But you see, that was the precious life that Satan seduced and went after and hunted him down. And thinking about that, the Holy Spirit's been giving me some thoughts that I want to share with you. First of all, some of the most wicked sinners on earth were at one time the most precious in the sight of God. They were the very most precious lives. The adulterers will hunt for the precious life. Picture any sinner you know, drug addict, alcoholic, homosexual, prostitute, any kid that you know that's lost, that's out. Remember at one time they were innocent children, and of them the Lord said, of such is the kingdom of God. They were innocent children. 
The devil came, saw something in them that frightened him and dumped on them, went after them. About six weeks ago, I was in a crusade in Sacramento. The third night, those who were standing up front to give their heart to Christ, a young man broke through the group and he came right up on stage. He said, I'm a witch and I want to be saved. His name was Stanley. He started five years before with the Ouija board. Do you understand that, young people? When you start playing Ouija boards and you play those witch games, you're going to open your mind and your heart for an attack of Satan. Stanley started the Ouija board, <clears throat> started on drugs, became a leader of a coven of witches in Sacramento. And I said, son, why would a witch want to be saved? He was so bombed out on drugs he could hardly talk. He spoke slowly and deliberately. And he shook that audience up. He said, two nights ago, I had a nightmare. He said, even though I'm a witch, I never thought I'd be possessed of the devil. You see, they think they can worship the devil without being possessed by the devil. He said, I never thought I'd be possessed. <clears throat> he said, two nights ago, in the middle of the night, I got a nightmare. He said, the room was filled with demons. And he described their ghoulish, grayish clothes described their horror of the moment. He said, it was like an unseen funnel. They were trying to funnel themselves into my body. And he said, I remembered something from my childhood. And I yelled, Jesus! And they all backed up against the wall. And he said, and a whole army gathered. They gathered strength and they were coming at me from all sides. And he said, I realized I was going to be totally possessed by legions of demons. And he said, and somehow I stood up and I yelled, Jesus! He said, and they all scattered and fled. And he said, it so thrilled me. I knew that I had to have this power of Christ to protect me. Right in front of 3,000 people, he cried out, Oh, Jesus, deliver me from the power of Satan. Save me. And after he prayed and the Holy Spirit made Christ real to him, I said, Stanley, if you mean that, you go home tonight and you gather up all your witchcraft, all your books and your swords and your sorceries, put them in a big box and bring them to the service tomorrow night. And I want some of the officers to take them out in the back lot and burn them. He was there at the church six o'clock in the morning with a huge box. And I, before the service that night, I went through that box and his curse books and his swords and his divining sticks and a, a huge trunk full of all of that uh, terrible occult junk. Well, folks, Stanley right now is at our Teen Challenge Center in Houston. Two weeks ago, he was in my meeting when I was in Houston, speaking clearly and fluently. And I said, Stanley... There's got to be a reason why the devil dumped on you. Stanley had told me, he said, Brother Deep, if you had seen me a week before I got saved in one of our seances, in one of our devil meetings, with a sacrifice, a nude sacrifice, and see the sex orgy, and you would have heard me cursing people that I hated, if you'd have seen the hate and the occult power on me, you would have looked at me and said, you're an evil seed. What did your mother, your father do? You're an evil seed. He said, you would have thought that, but I said, no, Stan, I don't think that way because I think the devil dumps on the precious one. I said, go back, tell me, there had to be a time in your life you were calling on God. And he smiled and he said, Brother Dave, when I was eight years old, I used to take my Bible out in an open field and I used to call on the Lord and I begged Him to let me preach the gospel. Well, you see, when he was eight years old, the devil saw something in that boy that terrified him. He knew that boy was one day going to shake the kingdom of hell. And so Satan, the adulteress, hunted him down. This precious life deceived him and took him into witchcraft. Stanley's going to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. <laughs> Nikki Cruz, born into a family of witchcraft, his mother into witchery, no call practices, one of 17 children. You remember the day that Nikki Cruz slapped me in the face and spit on me and said, go to hell? 
If you'd been there that day, you'd have thought just as I do. Anybody in New York can be safe but Nicky Cruz. Not if hell freezes over. That boy is an evil seed. It must have been because his mother was a witch. He was raised up in a spirit of witchcraft. That's why he wandered the streets stabbing people and the newspapers called him a, a heartless killer. Was Nicky Cruz a heartless killer? Or was it because when Nicky heard his mother say that he was an unwanted child, that Nicky Cruz goes into a little room and cries his heart out and says to God, if you're real, don't let me ever hear that again. Was it because when he was seven, eight years old and he heard his mother say that, the Lord took him up? Because when your family doesn't want you, the Lord takes you up. Did the Lord take Nicky Cruz in his arms and says, your mother may want, not want you? The world may not want you, but I do. And don't you know the devil saw the Lord Jesus put his arms around Nicky Cruz? He saw in that boy a flaming evangelist that would win thousands from his kingdom. And so Satan started dumping on Nicky Cruz. And he winds up in the streets of New York, a gang leader using drugs. The adulteress went after the precious life and deceived Nicky Cruz. Of course, you know what's happened to Nicky Cruz since then, don't you? Hey, what about your parents? And, and you have a son or daughter that's unsaved. Or you're a teenager and you've got a brother or sister, somebody in your family that's unsaved. <clears throat> I had a mother tell me she had four children and three of them were in a profession. And she said, I got one kid on the street who ran away. He's a junkie. She said, that's not bad. One rotten apple in the barrel. Oh, I thought to myself, oh, do you have it wrong? Oh, do you have it wrong? That was the precious one. You've got it wrong. And that's why you can't give up praying. That's why you can't give up because that one that's out there is the one that has the potential. And the devil saw that and went after them. If you've been saying, Lord, why is my boy, why is my girl falling away? Because the devil saw something. The devil saw something in it. <clears throat> About three weeks ago, in the middle of the night, the Holy Spirit woke me up, really actually woke me up, not an actual voice, but a still small voice, to call Pastor Ralph Wilkerson in California, Melody Land. A group of professionals had tried to slander the man. I just read a 30-page indictment, a filthy scandal sheet against him. And I don't like that, because I knew the devil was dumping on him. So I called him up and said, Ralph, you've been asking me to come for two years. I'm asking to come next Sunday, all day to preach in your church, because I'm mad at the devil, what he's doing to you. So I went. And Saturday night, we had lunch. And I saw two people heartbroken. And I said, Ralph and Eileen, I want you to go home tonight after you're done talking to me. And I want you to look in the mirror, and I want you to talk. I don't like people talking to the devil much, and I want you to talk to him just one time. And I want you to say, devil, what do you see in me that so scares you that you have to dump all hell on me in my church? What do you see in me? How precious I must be coming in the sight of God that you're hunting me down like this. Boy, you could just see the Holy Spirit lift the grief from his heart. And they did exactly that. And Sunday, the joy of the Lord... Came, I saw 3,000 people stand behind their pastor and because the devil was exposed. He was exposed before the whole congregation and the whole city that that was not an evil man. He had a repentant heart and the devil saw something in him that scared him. Is the devil dumping on you? Are you being tested and tried like you've never been tried in your life? You've got every right to say, Devil, what is there in me that scares you? What is God about to do in my life that you have to send all of your hordes against me? I must be so precious in the eyes of the Lord that the devil has to try everything he can to get to me. Do you say, why me? Lord, why, why do I have this kind of test in me? And the worst thing you can do is think you're some God-forsaken freak. Well, I'm backslidden. Now, that can be the case sometimes. But it's not always because you're not reading your Bible or not witnessing or not praying. Oh, no, it could be just the opposite, that you are witnessing, you are praying. Your heart reaches out to Jesus and the devil sees the potential in you. 
He sees how much you could be loving Christ and being used of God. And he'll come against you, not because you're backslidden, but because you're precious. Tell that to the devil. Tell that to the devil. Jesus said, my eye beholds every precious thing. He sees every precious thing on the face of the earth. I was in a crusade in Union Square Park last year in New York. And Union Square Park is where all the junkies in Midtown are forced by the narcotic agents. And it's in the center there's a square that's called No Man's Land. That's where you sell the drugs. But then if you want to get high, you go to your corner. The blacks on the north side and then on this side are the Puerto Ricans. The Rastafarians down here and all the rest, the Caucasians and others down on the south side. And we were setting up our equipment and a police officer came up and said, Mister, they don't want God. No one's going to get religion in this park. You're wasting time. And he was the first one to get saved. But I remember, I remember a filthy drug addict going all through that park. He followed me all over the park, calling me names and cursing at me, shaking his fist, threatening. He did that to others. He was insane. He was mad. He was, he was a mainliner, cursed, violently cursed, shaking his fist. And all through my preaching, he's standing right down over here making fun and everything else. And I was saying, you've got to receive Christ by faith. And he interrupted me for a moment after I was done preaching. He said, come here, come here. He said, he said, Hey, preacher, you don't take anything by faith today. He said, drugs, that's, that's an experience. You've got to feel it, man. Alcohol, that's an experience. You've got to feel it, man. Sex, that's a feeling. You've got to experience it. And you want me to just take Jesus by faith? He said, I don't take anything by faith. i got to feel it. And then he looked at me. He said, I'll tell you something, mister. If I could just feel God for one minute, if I could experience the presence of God, I'd get down right here and give my life to him. I'd preach. I'd do anything. You know, Carl Jung, one of the fathers of modern psychiatry, said, you can't argue with a man with an experience. You can argue a man out of a creed, but you can't argue with a man who has the experience. He's not intimidated by psychiatry or anyone else, because if you try to discount what he has, he'll say, I don't care what you say. I know what I experienced. And I looked at that boy and I said, Geez, I laid hands on his head. I said, Lord, you heard him. It's the only way you're going to reach him. And he fell like a bowl of jello and just started to sob and cry. He was experienced of the Lord. He jumped up. That, that kid jumped up. He said, I feel him. I feel him. He's here. It's real. I'm experiencing God. Oh, he put his arms around me and confessed and said, I'm so sorry, sir. And he went all over the park hugging people and confessing. <laughs> Who would know that that boy had a praying grandmother? Who would have known that he was the precious one of all in the park where everybody said, if, if God reaches anybody in that park, he can do it, but not him. In order to hear the continuation of the message, stop your tape machine and turn the cassette over. would know that that boy had a praying grandmother who would have known that he was the precious one of all in the park where everybody said if if God reaches anybody in that park he can do it but not him look at him he's he's cursing he's insane he's stoned on drugs oh my friends that was the precious one of all the most precious in the park and the Lord found him hallelujah you, you remember Job there's no other man like him on the earth at the time. You see, it's not your sin that attracts the devil as much as your holiness. He said to Satan, have you been thinking about my man Job? Have you discovered there's none like him on the earth? He's perfect and upright and he fears God and avoids all evil. Why was Job hunted down by the devil? Why was he hunted down like this? Because he was precious to God. Why did Jesus turn to Peter and say, Peter, Jesus knew he's headed for Pentecost. Now, the devil's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. In fact, the devil's not omnipresent. He can only be one place at one time. 
So if you hear a preacher in Fort Worth saying, Folks, let's pray because the devil's here tonight, the rest of the world can relax because he's in Fort Worth. No, he can only be one place at one time. Now, see, the devil doesn't need even an army of demons. He's got the flesh inside of us working for him, see. He doesn't even need all these demon powers. He uses them, but he's got the flesh in us working for him. The unbelievable thing is that this man, Job, was a holy, righteous man. And the devil came and hunted him down. Peter, Peter is headed for Pentecost. Jesus knows it. And I know the devil had an intuition that he was headed for some great thing. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, the devil has asked permission to hunt you down, to sift you like wheat. Peter, be careful because the devil's got a trap set for you. Now, was it because Peter didn't love Jesus? No, because three times he said, you know I love you, Jesus. Three times. Over and over, Peter, he knew he had love for his Savior. Peter was a godly man. It was not because Peter was impetuous. It wasn't because Peter was evil. It's because Peter was headed for Pentecost. And the devil saw how precious this man would become to the New Testament church. And he went after him to try to deceive him and hunt him down. Look what the devil does to the most precious life of all, the Son of God. The Bible said he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be hunted down by the devil. He was hunted for 30 days, or for 40 days and 40 nights. He's hunted all through the wilderness. Satan tracks him, hunts him down, throws temptation after temptation at him. His old brother Wilkson, what's the answer? Well, this is what God was dealing with me about last night. All right, first of all, the Bible says, He shall deliver the needy when he crieth. The poor also in him that is helpless, for God shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from the deceit of the devil, and precious shall their blood be in his eyes. I have told all four of my children, I've got two of them with me, I've told them, look, if you're ever in trouble, just call me. You know what that's the Lord says to you? Are you be hunted down? Are you in trouble? Is the enemy throwing temptation at you? He says, call on me. He said, he shall deliver the needy when he cries. I think the most horrible deception that's ever come to the New Testament church has been the prosperity, confess it and get it, doctrine. I don't even know what they call it anymore. Young people, do you know you don't have to play those kind of faith games? Those are silly little faith games that people who are immature play. My Bible says even though we don't believe at times, He remains faithful. He remains faithful. Hey, young people, listen to me. I couldn't serve a God who tiptoes around behind me, wait me for, wait for me to say the wrong thing, and he tiptoes around behind me and says, Aha, I caught you. I knew if I waited long enough, I'd get you. Now you have it, now you don't. Let me give you the world's number one negative confession. Job's wife. Curse God and die. That's negative. But she still got the blessings of Job, didn't she? Man, she just buried ten kids. How'd you like to stand in front of ten caskets? And your husband's got elephant tassels, so he, his loins are dry. He can't have any more babies or give any more seed. And so her past is gone, her future's gone. And there she is, and she says, Curse God and die. And the Lord knew what that dear lady's going through. And in his love, he held her precious. Sarah laughed in the face of God, but she still got her baby. She still got her child. That doesn't mean you go around using negative thoughts and negative words. No, I believe you should think positively on our faith. But you see, I don't believe God answers your prayer just because you figure out faith and you give him a certain quality or quantity of faith. I've got my teenage son, my last unmarried boy, he told me to say that, my last unmarried son here with me today, and we live in a wooded area, and suppose Greg was walking out in the fields, and he gets caught in an old abandoned trap, and he yells, Dad, I don't stop to analyze his faith, I don't stop to say, does he believe I'll come? Does he really believe I'm going to come? He's he yelling, Dad, help! I don't run to him and stand over that bleeding kid and say, Greg, 
Do you really believe I'm going to open that trap? Repeat after me three times. Daddy, I believe, I believe, I believe. Now, I'm not trying to be facetious, but that's a game people play with God. No, why does God come? Because you're, he, you're his child, he's your father, you're hurting, and when you cry, he answers. <laughs> Don't fall for that. that that's, I'm not going to call it false doctrine, I'm just call it silly doctrine. You don't have to play games with God. God sees your heart. And sometimes you're not capable of believing anything because you, your back's against the wall and you say, I'm, I just don't feel anything. I can't even believe anything hardly anymore. I don't even know my name. And yet deep in your heart, the you, Lord knows you love Him. So He reaches out. He, you say, God, help. And that's all you have to say. And He comes running. Don't play any faith games. What about your unsaved loved one that's caught in a trap? The adulteress has hunted your friend or your loved one down. It could be they've fallen into sin or they're sick and they're afflicted and the devil has them in a prison of despair. God made this so clear to me that the key, and we're not using it, the key to victory for our unsaved loved ones and for all those that we love and care about, the key is still the same as it's always been, intercession before the throne of God. A word we don't hear much about anymore. Very few preachers preach about it. Praying without ceasing. And that's the only thing intercession is. It's non-stop praying. That doesn't mean you have to be on your knees. But every waking hour you're breathing in prayer. You keep that thing in the sight of God all hours of the day. You keep pounding the throne of God. Now listen to this. Here's Peter. He's shaking the kingdom of hell. This is after Pentecost. Idols are being smashed. The kingdom of hell is being shaken by Peter. And so the devil hunts him down again and through Herod has him thrown in jail. And the Bible says, and Herod imprisoned Peter and put him between 16 soldiers to keep him, intending after the Passover to bring him forth to the people. But you see, Peter had friends who knew how to stand in the gap for him. He had some intercessors who prayed. Satan had trapped, hunted Peter down and trapped him. You know what the devil did? He said, Peter, you've become so precious to the Lord, I can't take it anymore. And he locks him up. And you know how the saying goes, he threw away the key. And there's Peter locked in jail. Man, he's in prison. And that's what some of you have to admit right now, Brother Dave, I've got someone I love that's in prison. Just like Peter, the devil's throwing away the key. They're locked, they're deceived. Now see, Peter was not deceived, but the devil thought he had him in his hold. But listen to this. Peter, therefore, was locked up in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. They didn't go around saying, well, let's just commit Peter to the Lord. They didn't say, well, let's all go up to that prison and let's all confess the doors open. They didn't stand around saying, well, let's just believe God. Not at all. They got together in a secret closet and they began to bombard heaven. The Bible said they prayed without ceasing. They began to intercede for that man locked up. You've got an unsaved loved one. And folks, we used to get burdens for unsaved loved ones. We used to get a hold of God. Now we say, well, I will commit him to God. I'm going to just take it by faith. I'll, I'll just confess his salvation. I'll confess her salvation. Oh, you'll do that, but you'll do more. You'll get a hold of the horns on the altar. And you'll pray without ceasing. You won't have a single enjoyable day other than the joy of the Lord in your heart. You won't give any peace to your prayer bones until you lay hold of God and you intercede and say, God, you open the doors. You set them free. My friend, my loved one's been ensnared by the adulteress, hunted down. My precious friend is in trouble. Oh, the power you and I have in prayer, and we don't know it. And the Bible said, and while they prayed, an angel appeared to Peter and his chains fell off. And the angel of the Lord said, follow me. And the Bible says, and the doors, the gates opened of their own accord. Nobody had to open them. They opened of their own accord. 
You don't have to bang doors down. You don't have to work angles. All you have to do is get on your knees and say, Lord, right now, I'm not going to give you any rest. If you thought Jacob wrestled with you, Lord, you haven't seen anything yet. Because I'm going to lay hold on this thing and I'll not give up and I, till I get the answer. I'm going to get violent with God. I'm going to get desperate with God. And if we do that, our altars and our churches would be filled. Your whole family would be saved. God really put this in my heart. That you and I are just abdicating to the devil. We're letting him run over our families. We're letting him run over people. There ought to be a holy anger in your heart right now saying, Oh God, that precious one that's been run over, that's enough. You pray the doors open of their own accord. You have the power and you have the responsibility to intercede, to bring down the angels and dispatch them, to make the doors open. Now what about you? Now here's something else the Lord said I had to add to this message or it wasn't complete. What about you? You see, you're precious. You're just as precious in the eyes of God. And I'm wondering now, but boy, this came to me so strong. For all of those who are going to be hearing me, you've been hunted down. Oh, the devil has been hunting you down. He's been throwing temptations at you and lust and trouble and despair and fear. He's really been hunting you down. You know, sometimes you've got to, it's just like Joseph. I study the life of Joseph. I cry every time I read the story of Joseph. Oh, I cry. He had such a dream and the dream blew up in his face. And he winds up in jail, in prison, locked up, hunted down by the devil, thrown in jail, and he's wasting away in jail. Year after year goes by, and the Bible said while he's in jail, the word of the Lord tried him. You know what that means? If you had been in jail with Joseph when he's all locked up, he tells you about the dream that he's had. And he says, now, it's not that I don't believe the word of God. It's not that I don't believe in prayer. But he's saying, the words try me because I don't have any evidence. There's no evidence that my prayers are being answered. Have you ever prayed like that? Say, Lord, nothing changes. I just need a little bit of evidence. Just a little bit of evidence I want to know. That's what the Bible says about the Word of God trying you. Just give me a sign. Give me some evidence. Have you ever prayed about something? Say, Lord, when's it going to happen? Hmm? There's a lot of heads bobbing. And the baker comes to him and the butler, and he says to the baker, you're going to get your job back. You're going to be reinstated. He said, you're going back. And, and I cried when I read what he said. He said to the baker, he said, you're going to be released. But he said, when you're released, please remember me to Pharaoh. He said, get me out of this place. For indeed, I've done nothing to deserve what has befallen me. Can you hear this great holy man of God just reach out to anybody, a friend saying, please, somebody help me. Get me out of here. I don't deserve what's happening to me. I don't know what's happened to me. Somebody anywhere, please help. And when you hurt, you reach. Just help somebody. Here's the great man of God saying, please, somebody, please remember me to Pharaoh because I don't know why I'm here. I didn't do anything. I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. I was stolen. Haven't you said that, Lord? I was minding my own business. I wasn't a drug addict. I wasn't an alcoholic. I didn't ask for this thing in my life. I don't know what's happened to me. God, I was loving you, and all of a sudden the devil dumped on me. And here I am in this prison of despair. Oh, somebody, please. And that's why people pick up tapes and records and telephones and everything else. It's reaching because of the hurt. And even the man gets out and he forgets him. His friends forget him. His family, everybody, nobody around. He's all alone. Two more years he wastes away there in that prison. But one day, just like that, the answer came. Hallelujah. And he was released. And what about you right now? What's the answer? Now, I think I've pretty well described the problem. I want to try to give you the last thing that God's laid in my heart. It's nothing fancy. It's very simple. In fact, it's something you know. But it's something we just don't like to do. The key to ending this hunt and getting out of this predicament that we find ourselves in, no matter what it is, is a graceful spirit of forgiveness. A graceful spirit of forgiveness. God wants you to become a graceful person. You know what grace is? 
that is unearned forgiveness. Somebody who hurts you, somebody walks on you, somebody who does you wrong, and yet though they don't deserve forgiveness, you forgive them. That's what grace is. Unmerited, unlimited forgiveness. There are some of you, somebody hurt you, somebody walked on you, and the devil almost inevitably uses other people to hunt us down and hurt us. He doesn't have to go outside of the universe. He doesn't have to call in a demon. He uses people. Think of the hurt that's in you. It's been caused by people. Who hurt you? Who deceived you? Who did you wrong? Did it happen just recently? Was it a year ago? Four years ago? Five years ago? Ten years ago? Fifteen? How long ago was it that somebody hurt you and all these months and years you have carried a subtle grudge in your heart to allow the Holy Spirit to come down to you with a flow of loving forgiveness to all who ever hurt you, your father, mother, brother, sister, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever it is, to forgive. What are you going to do about what Jesus said? Listen, this is so powerful, it's so to the point you and I can't escape it. If you will not forgive those who have sinned against you, Jesus said, neither will your Father forgive your sins. Now, you knew that was in your Bible, but if you dealt with that in your practice and the way you're living right now, listen to what Jesus said. If you will not forgive that person that hurt you and sinned against you, neither can your Father forgive your sins. That means that if you're holding a grudge against somebody, now listen, you're not on your way to heaven. Your sins are unforgiven. I don't care how many tears you prayed. I don't care how long you've asked God to forgive you. You may sit here thinking your sins are forgiven, but the Lord said Himself. These, came, these words came from the lips of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, if you will not forgive someone who hurt you and sinned against you, neither can your heavenly Father forgive your sins. It's impossible for God to forgive your sins if you're holding sin or grudge against somebody else. It can't, it can't be done. The devil has hunted you down, he's got you in his trap, and you can't get out. Maybe you've forgotten about it, just lays kind of subtle, easy on your mind. It's in the back quarters of your mind. But every once you, while well, you drag it out, you remember, you play it over. Are you mad at somebody? Grudging spirit. Don't you dare, don't you dare go another minute without stopping right now and saying, Oh, Holy Spirit, give me the grace. Give me the loving grace of Jesus to forgive. I don't care what it is. I don't care who it was. God, I want to forgive. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of gossip. I'm tired of that. I want to love people. I want to forgive people. I want the spirit of forgiveness to flow through me. When the spirit, when I'm forgiving others and the Holy Spirit is flooding my soul with forgiveness, then I am accepting that forgiveness for myself. Because you really can't get out of Satan's snare until you forgive yourself. And accept our Lord's forgiveness in your life. Oh, there's some of you willing to forgive other people, but you're not willing to forgive yourself. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, the one owed him 500 pence, the other 50, and when they had nothing to pay, he freely forgave them both. And the master said, tell me, which one of them will love him the most? Of course, him that was forgiven the most. But the point is this, that it doesn't matter whether you sinned a big sin or a little sin, it doesn't matter whether it's adultery or an evil thought, the Bible says they had nothing to pay. You've got nothing to give the Lord. You can't pay Him back for what's happened. He paid the price at the cross. He paid for your sins. You and I are to accept that loving forgiveness right now. He freely forgave them both. The man who sinned greatly, the man who sinned small. He freely forgave them both. Oh, that's the message. He freely forgave them. How can the devil, how can this adulteress hunt you down and trick you 
When you're spending all your waking hours just living in a spirit of forgiveness and thanking the Lord for being forgiven of all your sins, you know you're forgiven, you're on the way to heaven, and you've got the joy of the Lord, Lord, how can the devil touch you? Because you're flowing in the river of forgiveness. You're forgiving people. You're forgiving even the government officials that you don't like. You're even forgiving the communists. You're forgiving all of them. You're not liking what they say, but you're forgiving them. You hear of a preacher that's in trouble, from your heart you forgive him. Somebody in the church that's in trouble, a young man or a young woman that's in trouble, you say, hey, hey, did you hear what? Say, I don't want to hear, I want to forgive, and from your heart forgive them. And think the best of them, whether even though you hear something wrong, start thinking the best of them and let the spirit of forgiveness flow through your heart. And I know that's the secret. I know it and you know it. We all know it. Can you think of one person on the face of the earth that you couldn't put your arms around right now and say, I love you? Is there anybody you'd have to look in the face and your face would blush because you feel something against them? I said, oh, Jesus. I've been praying that last night. Oh, Jesus. Let me forgive. I don't want to hold a grudge against anybody. I want a spirit of grace. I want to be a graceful person. I want the grace of Christ. I love to be around people like that. Don't you? They have a forgiving spirit. They don't talk about people. They believe the best of people. They're not holding grudges against anybody. Hallelujah. Finally, this I close. Will you please accept your preciousness? You know, the hardest thing for us to believe is that God takes delight in His children. Two months ago, I ended a six-month period that I didn't preach anything. I just shut myself in with God. I had a place up in Arkansas and I went to fast and pray. And boy, for three months I, I was pressing. Oh God, I want you to give me the most powerful hellfire and brimstone sermons you ever gave a preacher. Lord, when I stand in the pulpit, I want to skin people alive. I want people to be so convicted they'll fall on their knees and can't even get to the altar. God, I want to lay it heavy on people. Oh God, I, there's so much sin in the church. There's so much undisciplined... There's so much lack of discipline. There's so much filth in the church, and I'm mad. God, give me such powerful hellfire sermons. Nobody can sit in their seat. Boy, and I prayed and prayed like that and, and studied and studied. Boy, you see, I'm that kind of a nature. I, I get stuck in the prophets. I read Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah and Isaiah and all those prophets, those heavy prophets. I love that because that's my nature. I'm kind of a melancholic but the third month, the Lord stopped me dead. He said, David, you got it all wrong. He said, you're not going to spank any of my children. You're not going to spank anybody. That's like the preacher said, boy, Lord, didn't I skin him good this morning? The Lord said, I'm not looking for hides. I want souls. And you know, the Lord made me get my Bible out and look up everything on love and reconciliation. And I wrote page after page after page and tablet after tablet till I couldn't write anymore. My wrist was worn. And I started looking back over and reading all those scriptures on how God loves His people, how He loves His children. And even when they sinned, His heart went after them. And all He wanted was a repentant heart. All He wanted was a, an admission. God, I need you. Father, I need you. And it was... How precious. I begin to realize how precious we are in the sight of God and how God delights in His children. And that's why he showed me this during that time. How precious we are in the sight of God. And I want, I, I will not let the devil take that away from me. I am precious in the eyes of the Lord. There are times I fail God. There are times I make mistakes. There are times I know I deserve hell. If you and I got what we all deserve, we'd all go to hell. We'd all be damned on the spot. But it's the grace of God, the unmerited love and favor and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus who says, I forgive you, I love you. So why shouldn't you forgive and why shouldn't you love? Hallelujah. This concludes the message. For copies of this message or a list of other messages by Rev. David Wilkerson, contact World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas. 75771. Unauthorized reproduction of this message is prohibited.